Welcome. This is the Free Market Roadshow, probably the largest annual series of public conferences on economics. Remarkable experts are discussing the challenges and providing libertarian solutions to today's problems. Organized by the Austrian Economic Center in cooperation with select th institutes, universities and think tanks, the Free Market Roadshow tours all over Europe. Today, we pay a visit to Tbilisi. Hello, I'm Vlaja Vardiza, rector of Sultan Saba Orbelian University. We are glad to host free market road shows for the third time. Sultan Saba Orbelian University, Saboni, was founded in 2002. Nowadays, we are a full university with accredited Georgian and English bachelor, master and PhD program in direction with the humanities, law, business and tourism. The university publications are recognized and integrated in the all three cycle of educational program throughout Georgia. The quality of the university's internationalization is one of the distinguished ones, has one of the most exchange program considering number of students. Our priority is to create an academic environment appropriate to personal interests and ability of students and harmonic to their intellectual and personal development. Our program meeting uh, with modern standards will supply students with the profound knowledge in various professional life. So, hello everybody. I am Giyad Andiyarid, a founder and uh, vice president of New Economic School. So we are one of the co-hosts of this event. We are hosting the Free Market Roadshow already 12th time. So we are happy to have it together with the Saba Uni. This is Sulfan Saba Orbelian University. And of course, with our Austrian partners, Austrian, Austrian Economic Center. So we will be concentrating this, this year about uh, how the pandemic influenced the economy in Georgia, in Europe, in the world. So we collected a nice, very great uh, team of speakers. Now I'm passing the word to the moderator, my colleague Georgi Chikwadze. Georgi, please. Ah, thank you, Gia. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure for me to moderate the session of Free Market Road Show. Already the third time, I think. And it's my pleasure to introduce you distinguished guests uh, from different countries, from Great Britain, from the United States, and from Georgia as well. The first speaker of our roadshow today will be the Dan Denning, who is the executive publisher at the South Bank Investment Research in London and the co-author of the Bill Banner letter. His belief is a free market, sound money, personal liberty, and limited government have and then 20 years of writing and research in the financial publishing industry and so on for the past 20 years then has examined the geopolitical and economic events that can affect your investments and your quality of the life so also he is the author of the 25 best selling the ball hunter published by john wilde the sons so now we have chance to listen to them thank you Well, hi, I'm Dan Denning, and thanks again for letting me join this year's Free Market Roadshow. Three years ago, I was on the Free Market Roadshow in Eastern and Central Europe. And at that time, we traveled to places like Kiev, Warsaw, Ljubljana, Prague, and Athens. And in those places, the principles I want to talk to you about today were more than just abstract ideas. When we talked with students and small business people and entrepreneurs in those countries, we all reached the same conclusion that those values are the very basis of free, prosperous societies. But in the last 12 months, those very values have been under more attack than any time ever, at least in my lifetime, specifically in the Western world. So today what I want to talk to you about are three principles to protect civil liberties and entrepreneurial freedom in the post-pandemic world. 
Now, the COVID-19 pandemic accelerated restrictions on individual liberty and economic freedom all over the world. And while some of this may have been necessary at the beginning of the pandemic as a short-term precaution, the actions taken by governments in the last 12 months pose a long-term threat to civil liberties, democratic accountability, as well as entrepreneurship and small business. So unless emergency powers are revoked and that the rule of law is vigorously defended, Western countries risk a permanent shift toward more authoritarian limits on small business and civil liberties. We will become more like China every single day. The time is now for defenders of individual liberty and entrepreneurial freedom to ensure that these temporary infringements do not become permanent. So as vaccinations roll out across the world this spring and summer, there will be no reason left to maintain illegal or unconstitutional limits on civil liberties and small business. Maximum pressure needs to be exerted at the political level and through the media to one, end emergency declarations that infringe on civil liberties and small business, and two, ensure that they never happen again at least without robust democratic accountability. So for the rest of my presentation, I wanna talk about three things. First, I wanna define what these civil liberties are and what's at stake if we lose them. Secondly, I wanna define what we mean when we talk about entrepreneurial freedom and what's at stake if we cease to value that. And finally, I'd like to define what I think are three principles that we can adopt to protect civil liberties and entrepreneurial freedom in a post-pandemic world. But first, what civil liberties are we talking about? Well, everyone should be pretty familiar with these. We're talking about the five freedoms outlined in the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, and we're talking about the four freedoms in the Treaty of Lisbon or in the Schengen Agreement. So, in summary, those are freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press, freedom to petition the government for redress of your grievances, and with the Schengen freedoms, we're talking about the free movement of goods, the free movement of capital, the freedom to establish and provide services, and most importantly, we'll spend a lot of time on the free movement of people. So let's go through each one. First of all, let's talk about freedom of speech. Now, it does not take, unfortunately, a great deal of imagination to see the ubiquitous mask or face covering as a kind of muzzle on democracy or to see mask mandates as a form of suppression of free speech. But masks are not symbols. They have a, a valid and legitimate public health purpose. But beyond the symbolism of the mask, the real threat right now to freedom of speech is the enforcement of de facto speech codes created by governments and enforced by multinational technology corporations. It's a dangerous collaboration between Silicon Valley and big government. In China, it's the Chinese Communist Party that does the censorship. But in the last 12 months, and in the post-pandemic world, if we're not careful, it's going to be Google, Apple, Facebook, Twitter, and Amazon. The trend toward punishing or criminalizing political speech with which you disagree strikes at the very heart of the First Amendment. We need to be absolutist in our defense of free speech now more than ever. The second freedom is freedom of the press. And here I'm talking about the deplatforming of independent and alternative media and the pursuit or the illegal detention of whistleblowers like Edward Snowden and Julian Assange, who exposed the illegal activities of various and numerous governments. Now, often this deplatforming is done on the grounds that what's being deleted or censored is fake news, that it's not factual or that it's the propaganda sponsored by a foreign government, usually Russia, China, or Iran, or simply it's conspiracy theories that are the product of potentially violent domestic extremists. Now, the result is what author George Orwell might call a kind of private sector ministry of truth, run by major corporate media working hand in glove with local governments. In the post-pandemic world, the press is no longer speaking truth to power or holding public officials accountable. It's working with them in many cases to advance a specific narrative that supports government policy 
and is both anti-liberty and anti-entrepreneurial. The third freedom is freedom of religion. Now, in February, the United States Supreme Court struck down the state of California's total ban on religious services. Justice Neil Gorsuch, who's from the state of Colorado, where I am right now, said that it simply didn't make sense that re retail establishments could safely operate at 25% of capacity, but that churches or synagogues or mosques could not. Now, the court did maintain a ban on singing and chanting, deferring to California's public health experts that said this behavior could increase the transmission of COVID-19. But here we have a similar situation in New York City, where the state's COVID-19 restrictions were also struck down. Those restrictions took on a distinctly anti-religious character, particularly anti-Jewish. But the bottom line is that the court reiterated that even public health emergencies do not unequivocally justify the free exercise of religion, which is guaranteed by the First Amendment. Now, the fourth freedom in the First Amendment is the freedom of assembly. Nothing prevents organized political opposition or dissent like preventing people from peaceably assembling. Yet that's what we've seen all over the world, in Australia, in New Zealand, in Europe, and even here in parts of the United States. The stated reason was to prevent the transmission of the COVID-19 virus by preventing large public gatherings. But the public health orders have been applied inconsistently. Organized protests against lockdowns have been broken up by police, while political protests for social or other justice matters have been permitted to continue. So the lack of consistency in the application of the public health orders reveals to me their inherently political nature, which is to suppress dissent. The law is the law. People are constitutionally allowed to gather and peacefully protest public policies they feel are unfair or illegal. Now, number five is the right to petition the government for a redress of grievances. And there are a lot of people who have justifiable grievances against lockdown policies. These policies have limited their ability to make a living and provide for their family. Perhaps none more so than small businesses that have been shut down while big retail outlets and chain food stores have been allowed to remain open. Now, public officials at the federal, state, and local levels have said they need to defer to the authority of public health experts. And I think at the beginning of the pandemic, most reasonable people had no problem with this. Now, we know that lockdowns affect all aspects of civilized society, and that it's probably a mistake to give emergency powers to unelected public health officials for an indefinite period of time. The emergency becomes permanent, and there's no longer any democratic means for addressing the total costs of the lockdown on the wider community, including the suppression of constitutionally protected liberties. We end up becoming governed by technocrats who are singularly focused on one issue to the detriment of everything else, not least of which are civil liberties and entrepreneurial freedom. Now let's move to the four freedoms covered in the Schengen Agreement. The first is two of them, free movement of goods and capital. Now, COVID-19 has exposed the vulnerabilities in global supply chains and in just-in-time logistics. It's going to be up to businesses to figure out how to become more resilient or more anti-fragile in the case of future pandemics. Capital, on the other hand, continues to move around the globe at a lightning pace. To me, the big danger is that some $24 trillion in stimulus response has been spent or promised by governments and central banks all over the world, not only to deal with the pandemic, but the cost of the lockdown that were imposed by those same governments. Now, this has led to a big increase in government liabilities and central bank balance sheets and could lead to much higher inflation in 2021 and eventually, because of that, higher interest rates. That itself would create a large worldwide financial shock similar to the crisis of 2008 or 2009, but this time with the epicenter in government bonds. Another of the four freedoms from Shenzhen is the freedom to establish and provide services. Now, entrepreneurs, as most of us know, who have worked with them or who are them, are natural risk takers. They embrace uncertainty. Indeed, many of them see uncertainty as opportunity. But given the precedent set in the last year around the world, 
that your business can be summarily closed or that new operating conditions can be imposed at will by unelected officials, there is a real risk that small businesses and the creation and formation of them will take a big hit in the post-pandemic world, unless there's an explicit rollback of those pandemic limitations. Some government programs have been created to provide loans to enterprises that are the most affected from the lockdown policies. But if you talk to any small business owner, they don't want government help. What they want is the freedom to provide goods and services in their communities, to manage the risks of doing so safely for those customers who are also taking the responsibility of managing their own personal health risks during the pandemic. Now, the last freedom we need to talk about that's been impacted by the pandemic is probably the biggest one, and that's the freedom of the movement of people. Now, it's important to remember one thing here, that the very term lockdown comes from the management of prisons and correctional facilities. It's an inherently authoritarian term that treats all free people as if they were prisoners of the state. In my mind, the big danger in the post-COVID-19 world is that the free movement of people across national borders or even within those borders can be revoked with the stroke of an executive pen or require the permission of a so-called green passport, which proves that you've been vaccinated. The precedent that you need permission to exercise your natural rights and liber liberties has been set with the government response to COVID-19. What's astonishing is that hundreds of millions of people have willingly accepted what amounts to voluntary indefinite house arrest. Now again, I don't want to be unreasonable. You can't really argue with people trying to do the right thing and slow the spread of a deadly virus. Most of us would agree that that's the responsible thing to do as a good citizen. But there's no doubt in my mind that some public officials at all levels of government have less interest in doing the right thing and more interest in controlling small businesses and individual liberties. They are now willing and eager to restrict the free movement of people for any publicly declared emergency, which could be another virus, a natural disaster, or because of domestic terrorism, which is a term we're suddenly hearing a lot about here in the U.S. So to review, the pandemic has accelerated the restriction of civil liberties all across the world. It's become a concerted attack on freedom of speech, religion, the press, freedom of assembly, and the freedom of movement. The social mood, which is driven at the moment by fear, seems to have switched in favor of safety over liberty. And unless this trend is reversed, we could face permanent new restrictions on civil liberties, which took hundreds of years to establish and protect through our laws and institutions. This will shift the balance of power in civil society from individuals, small businesses, and voluntary organizations to centralized government and big corporations acting together to protect their interests at the expense of our freedoms. So as Lenin infam infamously asked, what is to be done? Well, I'd like to put forward three principles that should govern our public debate about the post-COVID world and be our rallying point to win the argument in the defense of civil liberties and entrepreneurial freedom. First, we should follow the Swiss model and embrace the idea of subsidiarity. That principle is enshrined in Article 5 of the Lisbon Treaty. And the principle is this, that political power, when it's used at all, belongs and is most legitimate when it's closest to the people. Power is more accountable to the people when applied at the local and state level. National emergency policymaking is an alarming trend that's inherently undemocratic and hostile to civil liberties and free enterprise. We should fight it and reject it. Number two, we should embrace antitrust action against big tech's censorship of free speech. Now, most of us who believe in the free market resist government intervention. We understand that consumers are smart enough to decide what businesses they want to patronize and that government shouldn't pick winners. The research shows that antitrust regulation can backfire and establish or perpetuate monopolies by creating competitive moats that small business simply can't cross. But a collaboration between Silicon Valley and big government to determine what speech is permissible 
and what is canceled would, by one name, be called corporatism, and by any other name, fascism. We simply cannot let big tech become the arbiter of free speech on behalf of big government. And remember, controlling speech isn't about the speech. It's about controlling the action that follows from the speech. And more importantly, it's about controlling thought. If you control the speech, then you teach people to self-censor. This is the most effective form of authoritarian control, and it's why we must resist it so vigorously. And finally, we need to reject the false narrative that the pandemic response and lockdowns value human lives over human rights. This is not a case of putting people over profits. Supporting your family and providing goods and services to your community is neither greedy nor selfish. Asking for all of civil society to be shut down so you feel safe is selfish, particularly when we're talking about small businesses. We're talking about the freedom individuals have to pursue their passions and apply their talents, not only for their own enrichment and betterment, but for the betterment of the community they're a part of. To deny them this right is to deny them the means to support themselves and their family. It is also a denial of the right to pursue happiness and the flourishing of your individual potential, or what Aristotle calls eudaimonia. Public health and welfare can only best be served if we recognize that destroying the livelihoods of millions of people is not only bad public policy, but also undemocratic and immoral. So, we on the front line of the liberty movement have a lot of work to do. The stakes have never been higher, but the folks that work with the Free Market Roadshow and the Hayek Center have always been champions of these ideas. More importantly, the peaceful engagement of debate to promote ideas that we think are valuable. So I hope that this has been useful to you, and good luck out there. We've got a lot of work to do, so let's get to it. Thank you. Uh, it was really, really great contribution for today's uh, roadshow. Now we have three more speakers, and it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Mr. Jeffrey Tucker, who is a editorial director of the American Institute of Economic Research. He also is a managing partner of Volume Capital, senior distinguished fellow of the Austrian Economic School in Vienna, honorary fellow of Mises Brazil founder and chief liberty officer of Liberty. He is also an advisor to blockchain application companies, past editorial director and the found of the Foundation for Economic Education and Les Fair books. So, uh, Mr. Tucker, so the floor is yours, so you can start your presentation. Yes, I very much, uh, I hope my sound is good, I hope it sounds good. Um, I very much appreciate that last presentation. I, I completely agree with every word of it. Um, I, I would like to address something a little more uh, fundamental as it relates to uh, the virus itself, and why is it that it was so effective to uh, use the existence of a new pathogen in our midst to fundamentally uh, do everything that liberalism traditionally understood completely opposes. Uh, travel restrictions, shutting down churches, shutting down businesses, uh, putting people in uh, uh, at, at really under house arrest. Uh, there was one moment early in the pandemic, it's actually a true story, that once uh, and this is in the United States, in Massachusetts, that once the house arrest came came down, they said, you, you cannot leave your home. Of course, some people had to leave their home to deliver groceries, for example, you know, um, but most people were told uh, that they, they couldn't leave their houses. Um, it, but to be out on the road in those days meant that you had to have special permission. So I, I actually wrote up a special what you would call like a, a pass. So I typed it on official letterhead and gave it to all, all the employees who were coming and going so that they would have it in their cars in case they were stopped by the police to ask why they were driving somewhere. And I had to create this pass for myself. It was like my own internal passport to give to my own employees so they could even get uh, uh, to work and back. That's how extreme it became. I mean, 
it's impossible to describe, this was a little more than a year ago, about 14 months ago, just how dark and terrible uh, and terrifying the world became almost instantly. And why? Because of a disease fear, because of a panic over a respiratory virus, uh, a coronavirus, uh, a coronavirus that we know very well from a century of research. We know exactly uh, how they behave, the kind of therapeutics that are important for them, uh, how to observe them and what to do about them. And it seemed like in an instant, all of our knowledge about this was completely uh, vanished. It was as if we treated uh, the arrival of a new respiratory pathogen as some sort of asteroid from, from, from another planet a great external shock that was an unwelcome visitor that we had never seen the likes of before, uh, comparing to the bubonic plague or something like this. So as a result, uh, uh, there was a wild panic in the air, and I think the political reaction was, to a great extent, a response to the public panic. Now, you might ask yourself, what is the basis of this public panic? Because I think we're going to, we're gradually discovering over time that the infection fatality ratio, which is the, uh, the, the relationship between the, the number of affected and those people who have severe outcomes, uh, is comparable to something like, a it was more intense than the seasonal flu, but not that much uh, more than the seasonal flu. Um, and, and under the age of 70, the inf it, infection fatality ratio uh, uh, is, is, is extremely low. It's 0 0.03, I think, is, is about uh, what it is. And if you exclude those people who already have pre-existing diseases, uh, this is for the vast majority of those people who are under the age of 70 and have no pre-existing uh, immunocompromises uh, was a, a, a relatively minor annoyance of, of a few days, with some exceptions, or I always say some exceptions, but a few days of loss of taste and smell. So we did all of this to the world. We rejected 500 years of legal tradition and freedoms and presumptions of human rights of freedom to travel, uh, to go to church, uh, go to concerts, to gather in groups, even the number of people you could have in your home, whether and to what extent you could have one or two families over for, for, uh, for dinner was, was uh, blocked and people were literally being arrested. Right now I'm speaking to you from Texas. I can tell you that in rural Texas in, in uh, April of 2020, uh, 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 SWAT teams, uh, which are, which are uh, uh, you know, the shock troops of American force of law, uh, with bulletproof vests and heavy armed uh, machine guns and that sort of thing, you know, would arrest people in, in uh, beer bars in the middle of rural Texas and take them all to jail. This actually happened in the land of the free and the home of the brave. So, so it's utterly bizarre to, to, to imagine this. And here we are about 14 months later, we're nowhere near uh, getting our freedoms back. It's true that Florida is is open, uh, Texas is finally open, Georgia is finally open, but 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 Broadway is not open. You still cannot go to uh, a live concert in New York, at least not legally. Uh, they're playing around with you cannot travel internationally uh, without a vaccine uh, passport, and even then you have to wear a mask the entire time. So our our freedoms. Uh, where we are right now in the world are massively truncated compared to what they were uh, last year. So we have lost so many of our rights, and again, all over a, a disease panic uh, that began with uh, the arrival of a new uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, the a pathogen, uh, a coronavirus that was basically a modification of SARS-CoV-1 that hit us in 2003 and 2004. It didn't quite make its way to Europe, although there were tremendous preparations for it and it never quite made it, and it didn't come to the United States. It did affect uh, places like uh, Taiwan, uh, China, Bangladesh, Singapore, and other places in, in that region. And we know now, uh, in retrospect, that there are cross immunities to those people who had been previously exposed to SARS-CoV-1, 
uh, with those who are exposed to SARS-CoV-2. Now, the infection fatality rate, and I, I don't want to get too, too technical about this, of SARS-CoV-1 was much, much, much higher. It's actually quite a fatal disease. Um, uh, the the uh, uh, variant of that, uh, the, the, the modification of that uh, pathogen with SARS-CoV-2 is much more mild, which is what you always see in the world of pathogens. There is a dynamic at work in, in epidemiology that's very similar with economics. You see patterns and, and ways that viruses move uh, that are independent of, of politics. In the same way, in economics, you have uh, things like supply and demand and uh, velocity of money, quantity of money as it relates to productivity increases. These are natural forces that work in the world and there's nothing politics can do to change them. All they can do is, is mess them up. Well, it's the same thing in the world of pathogens. Uh, for a respiratory virus like this, there is always what's called a trade-off between the, the virus subject to its latency. So you can put that in an equation and see that the more prevalent a virus it is, the less severe it is. And that you can look at that as a, a law of epidemiology. You can look at it mathematically. Uh, the point is that everybody who gets the virus and recovers is now immune to it, um, but they're not dead, right? So when they get the virus, it doesn't kill them. Instead, they pass it on and then they recover. Then they pass it on and recover. When enough people have had the virus and recovered, now the virus doesn't have anywhere to go. And the virus goes from a pandemic to endemic. Endemic is the world word we use to describe something that's stable, manageable, and predictable, like the flu or uh, a cold. Now, um, the severity, uh, if it's extremely severe, something like Ebola, um, then it kills its host immediately and stops. It doesn't have time uh, uh, to find a new host because the host is dead. So that's why there's always this trade-off between severity and, and prevalence subject to latency, which is the amount of time that the virus uh, lives in your system without giving you symptoms. A classic example of a very long stage of latency is the AIDS HIV uh, virus, which can live with you for a very long time. You won't know it. That was not the case with uh, SARS-CoV-2 is very short uh, latency. So you, you get over the virus, you move on with your life. Um, but instead of recognizing this basic principle of, of virology and epidemiology, the whole world went absolutely crazy. It was fueled in part by the disease modelers. Um, Neil Ferguson at his Imperial College in, in, uh, in uh, 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 England uh, put out forecasts for the disease uh, that uh, imagined it being a, a case fatality rate in the range of three and four uh, percent, had uh, predictions all over the world of death that turned out to be 1,000, 2,000, even 10,000 times uh, higher than, um, uh, than was true in reality. And uh, just, a, just a wild, ex ex wildly exaggerated uh, predictions. And the same thing happened in the United States. Now, Anthony Fauci, our own uh, head of the NIH went in front of Congress and said that he thinks that the fatality rate, he didn't specify if he meant the infection fatality rate or the case fatality rate, those are really different, uh, different uh, numbers, was uh, not three and four percent, but those sound a little high to him, but it's certainly close to one percent. And, and he was looking out at all the congressmen and you could see on their faces this look on their face like, I'm about to die. <laughs> I mean, there was, it was really, a, you should go back and watch that hearing. It was, you could see what was going on with all these old dudes in Congress. They're like, my God, I'm going to die from this thing unless I shut down the economy. I mean, it was really like that, you know? And I said, geez, oh God. And, and then you had the New York Times, uh, which on March the, no, February the 28th, uh, on February 27th, a guy named Donald McNeil uh, gave a, a podcast in which he said, uh, it's likely that one in six of your friends will die and that the only way to stop this is for you to be locked into your uh, disease-ridden home 
and and separated from the rest of the world and that we should shut down the nation's highways and 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 land all planes and shut all businesses he actually said this in the new york times and the new york times is a fairly responsible news organization they actually ran this and the very next day they ran an article uh, called to take on the coronavirus let's go medieval and the article starts he says the modern way to deal with viruses is to look at them with calm rationality let them circulate among the non-vulnerable populations try to protect those populations that are more vulnerable to a virus and uh, and gradually try to uh, work on symptoms through therapeutics while we work on a vaccine. He said, but the medieval way is to lock everybody in their cities and, and block all the roads and, and, and stop the spread and, and, and make the virus go away through force. And he said, in this case, we have no choice. We have to pursue the medieval route. So this is the New York Times. By the way, this reporter, Donald McDill, has since been fired for using a racial epithet uh, three years ago on on a on a field trip so you know we're, we're this is a very strange world in which we live in other words the media was hugely responsible for fomenting this panic now the question i always ask myself in this in this case is why did it work so well like how did they get away with it and i think the answer really comes down uh to the fact that the, the public, and when I say the public, I include here also libertarians, uh, li you know, political activists on the right and the left, and even among libertarians, who knew nothing at all about the subject of public health and the behavior of viruses. Uh, it was, they, they have this, this deep, and I understand, but you know, many people don't sit around and read books on cell biology. So they didn't understand the basic principles of viruses. They didn't know that pathogens have always been among us and they will come back again. It's the nature of the world. We live in a complex relationship with, with uh, the world of, of pathogens out there and germs and diseases. We have immune systems that have evolved to deal with them uh, because they scale up in, in light of the, of the new pathogen. You have to get the disease, you get the mildest idea of that disease, and that protects you in a cross-immunity sense against the more severe forms. That's the way we trick our immune systems to stay healthy and well. Uh, so it's exposure, ironically, and it's very difficult for people to understand this, but it's exposure that keeps us healthy. Not cleanliness, not sanitation. Anyway, we forgot all these principles. The public was by and large ignorant of them. Uh, the American school system is so bad that people paid absolutely no attention to ninth grade biology, even if it was taught. So there was a tremendous amount of ignorance and that left us vulnerable to having to trust these experts in the medical, uh, uh, the public health profession who had become obsessed with the idea of computer modeling and keeping people apart uh, through, through force. Next thing you know, their central plans were, were, were dropped, uh, you know, imported from China first dropped in northern uh, Italy, and then very quickly came to the United States and spread to the UK and Canada and all over Latin America and essentially all over the world. As far as I know, there are only five places in the world that consistently refuse to lock down. Five! And listen to this list. It's crazy, right? Tanzania, yeah. Belarus, Sweden, Taiwan, and South Dakota. Why? Why only those five places protected freedom? It's unbelievable. Out of the entire world, you had five territories that consistently protected people's freedoms. Belarus is a totalitarian, authoritarian dictatorship, but they didn't lock down. You know, it's, um, all right, I gotta try to wrap this up because I know I've used a lot of time, but I will tell you this. I've assembled at the American Institute for Economic Research 35 studies showing there's no correlation whatsoever between lockdowns and disease mitigation. You cannot show any kind of statistical relationship between those two things. Whether you locked down or whether you stayed entirely open, the disease took exactly the same course and there's, there's no way you can demonstrate any correlation there whatsoever. And the same goes for mask wearing, stay at home orders, capacity limits, travel restrictions. None of this stuff works. It never has worked. We knew this already. 
uh, back in uh, 2006, a great, uh, a great treatise by Donald Henderson, the world's greatest epidemiologist of the 20th century said, don't use any of these things. These are inhumane, they're contrary to human rights, and they will not work and they will cause a massive loss of trust in, in public authority, particularly public health authority. Uh, we've seen the pervasive uh, uh, myths generated over the last year. Oh, if you get COVID, you're gonna have permanent heart damage. No. Uh, if you get COVID, you're gonna have long COVID and be depressed. No, you're probably depressed because you're being forced home. That's why you're depressed. Uh, it, you know, if uh, the way to stay away from COVID is to constantly clean everything. No, uh, uh, the coronavirus does not live on surfaces uh, and, and, and sit there waiting for you to touch it. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you don't generate the coronavirus by being around people. You have to be around infected people. So just being around people itself does not cause SARS-CoV-2 to suddenly appear. So the amount of it that was generated from this disease panic was unbelievable. We lived through truly times. In the U.S., you could not get medical care for six months. You could not get dentistry. If you were having a baby, you had to go alone to deliver with a mask. Um, uh, it was crazy time. Do you know that U.S. healthcare spending in the course of the last year during the pandemic, do you think it went up or down? You think it would go massively up, right? It went down because people could not get cancer screenings. They could not get their surgeries. They were locked out of their own hospitals. All the hospitals were reserved for COVID-19 patients that never arrived, okay? So this is a catastrophe. We're going to be recovering from a year of students were not allowed to go to school. We're going to be recovering from this thing for the next year. My friends, what are we going to do about this? I suggest to you, and I speak now as a libertarian to libertarians, we have massively underestimated the, the job that we need to do. We sit around talking about uh, little debates about taxes, regulations, and tariffs. Meanwhile, the vast swath of humanity, including most states of the world, don't even recognize the basic uh, fundamental rights of the freedom to, 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 to travel, to move, to trade, to open your business, to go to church, uh, much less uh, so human rights are out and basic freedoms and the need for society to function. Like if you can't, don't have a functioning society and markets, you can't even talk about the rest of it. I would say there's a good reason for libertarians right now to be sad and shocked of what's happened to the world. On the other hand, it should wake us up that we have a massive job to do to explain what happened over the last year and work to make sure it never happens again by emphasizing those five freedoms and, and calling humanity to re-embrace enlightenment values of human rights and freedom uh, and reject these uh, calls for central planning under any reason, especially for the mitigation of these. And I think I've taken enough time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your brilliant speech. And in you know, some cases seems very really ridiculous not to be very satiric, but you know, it's reality what we have during this period. So now we have uh, two more speakers uh, from Georgia. Uh, the first one is Mr. Nikolos Hunzakishvili, who is the a pro bono activist, his pro bono activism includes, uh, among others, uh, he is the vice, first vice chairman of the International Chamber of Commerce of Georgia, the executive board member of the Georgian Employers Association, the business advisory board member of San Diego University, and uh, many, 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 uh, many other uh, things. His life is very interesting person, and he would talk from the uh, business perspective about the consequences of this pandemic restrictions, especially in Georgia. So please, floor is yours. Uh, hello. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, it's my privilege to be here and I would like to thank the organizers uh, of this roadshow uh, for this wonderful opportunity to talk to you. Today, as uh, the moderator announced, I will be speaking from the business perspective about the about the impact of COVID pandemic on the business in Georgia. So I will be speaking about Georgia and some mitigations tools we, the business community, expect from the government in order to recover from the problems caused by the pandemic. And then how to develop the investment climate in the country. This is also a part of my 
five to seven minutes each. I will not take more time than that. So when we talk about the impact of COVID to the companies, we had to define two broad categories of the uh, businesses. Let's say the first category is, and we are speaking about SMEs for sure, because the large companies, they have more or less uh, more resources, including financial and human resources. So we are speaking about two broad categories uh, of SMEs. One who have EU standards. Uh, they found relatively easy to comply with the new regulations, which was introduced by the government during lockdowns. Such enterprises uh, already had, uh, let's say, mi risk mitigation processes in place, and they adjusted easily to new rules and um, restrictions. So another part of the companies, uh, as I said, especially SMEs, they had no prior experience and they had hard effects they have been hardly affected, and uh, because they had to, they had to start to learn from the very beginning uh, about the new normal, how to live. So uh, we have in Georgia identified some impediments. So there are very many, but you know I made a um, couple of them. Uh, that was in fact obstacle to the business. So uh, let's let me put uh, in the in the uh, to, to list them. The first obstacle for the business uh, was access to finance during the pandemic. So we know that the financial institutions became more cautious to provide working capital loans to the enterprises. So they created so-called uh, liquidity problems for most SMEs. So that was a real problem that Georgian SMEs started to tackle, liquidity problem. So demand shock, uh, this is the Another, uh, let's say, impediment uh, that we faced during pandemic, pandemic. So this is uh, the demand shock caused the production decrease, and this was most probably the most significant impact that uh, we experienced. The third, let's say, problem uh, that was cost of the new regulations which was increased, including EU regulations. As you know, Georgia has signed the association agreement with the European Union in 2014. Uh, it entered into the force uh, 2014 with the deep and comprehensive free trade area. And the cost of the regulations during pandemic was increased. There are several reasons for that. I will not go deep. Another impediment to the problem that we identified, which was before the pandemic, but it was amplified, let's say, was the uh, qualification of the workforce. And this is a challenge in the country. And the qualification of the workforce and among and, uh, and on top of it, the qualified workforce start to leave the country for another, let's say, career opportunities. So those are, let's say, the least of uh, the uh, challenges that we had identified during the uh, pandemic. As a takeaway, let me state them again. This is access to finance, demand shock, cost of the adjustment to the new EU regulations, and of course, the qualified uh, uh, workforce. There are very many others, but all those others are derived from, uh, from that uh, I have already listed. So what tools should we uh, should we expect from the government to minimize, to mitigate those problems caused by the pandemic? But before that, let me also state what we, uh, the investors, the business community, expect in Georgia in order to develop the investment climate. So the expectations we have from the government is, let me list also, the consistent, predictable, and transparent business-related legislation. So legislation that support the business, or at least does not harm the business. So this is one. The second is we expect from the government to have the rule of law, therefore independent, impartial, and efficient judicial. Without that, forget all the investments in the country. So another one is unnecessary government, so no unnecessary government interference that we do not need them. So as freedom is a driver, let's say, the economy. So another point, expectation that we have that government should push and promote is the reasonable taxation, fair and impartial tax practice that we we request, we expect, and how government will implement. This is another subject. And last but not least, available, educated, and 
trainable workforce. So those are our expectations, let me say, from the government, from the business community. So now how governments should react, this is our kind of uh, recommendation, let's say the mitigation tools that government to exercise, this is also our, let's say, recommendation and at the same time anticipation that government should do. Uh, for example, the comprehensive reform agenda to boost growth and enhance economies' resilience. So, if you have, in one hand, uh, the problems, on another hand, you have to try hard, the government, to amplify, to push forward the comprehensive reform agenda, which will include also economy, you know, social sphere, uh, education, of course, etc., healthcare, which is very important. So, the second point is the government to involve the business community into the decision making process. So, we need the decision making process to be with us, I mean, we to be in that process together with the government because those stuff that they are going to make. This, con this concerns the business. Therefore, we have to be part of this process. And which is also very important, we need to have in the country the robust public-private dialogue kind of mechanism in order to build the mutual trust and understanding. So this is very important in order the government and the private sector to sit together and to discuss together. This will definitely uh, help, you know, business community and the government to have the quality communication between each other. And last but not least, again, our, let's say, recommendation and the mitigation tool is to have uh, reforms in the government itself to reduce the bureaucracy. And in fact, we ask them to be more in terms of the good governance. So we need good governance in the country. So those are our recommendations to the country. And to put all together what I have said earlier, there are some problems caused by the pandemic. There are inherited problems uh, in the country. Altogether, we have uh, the situation that if not those, let's say, uh, mitigation tools, which is reforms, business community involvement in the decision-making process, public-private dialogue, etc., reduction of the bureaucracy, there is no future for the investments. And the small figures also, we have to know that in 2020, the foreign direct investment was in Georgia historic low, uh, low uh, for the last 15 years, so only around 600 million US dollars. And among those money, only $9 million were the contribution to the equity. The rest was reinvestment and some loans from different financial institutions, etc. So, which means that from, uh, for example, I come from the from the uh, business uh, beverages industry because I'm one of the uh, director of uh, one of the largest uh, brewery in the country, that uh, in my case, the unit case, let's say the unit that we measure our production is 20, for example. And the unit case for measuring the uh, FDI is something like $100 million. When we are speaking about $9 million investment in the country, in the equity, this is almost zero. So, this is a result of uh, the uh, of those problems that we have only through reforms, only through comprehensive reform agenda, as I said earlier, reduction of the bureaucracy of governments is the improvement of the business climate and the investment climate. So, uh, I will stop here, but before uh, closing, let's say before uh, um, uh, finishing my presentation, I would like to add that, uh, again, we need from the government, first to keep the logical line to the EU integration, because this is the best ever chance for Georgia to transform our society, our business, in accordance to the EU standards, which is very important, as I said, historic uh, chance. And second, the government to act responsibly, and which is very important, to act rationally and predictably. So predictability is a key word uh, I always used to say, that if the government is not predictable, no investor will come to the country for the investment. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, so we have a couple of minutes left. I see some uh, questions appear in the system, but we don't have any problems. So any any time. So I I want to introduce again Mr. Gia Jandieri, Vice President of NSG. Okay. So 
I have a few minutes to talk, but I will just concentrate on, on my uh, arguments, which I wrote uh, more than one year ago. Uh, I was trying to explain what is the solution for the, the crisis created by the pandemic. And my position was very strict that only entrepreneurs can change the situation because they are the most powerful, innovative and creative uh, people and without them there is there is no chance to improve the economy so my my and our colleague and very good friend then mitchell told me about this my comment that we need entrepreneurial uh, power all the time not only during the pandemic but we need them all the time but then why entrepreneurs because they are always looking forward and they always want to do something they always want to make money they always want to make some production etc etc so this is their very very powerful thing so but how can we help the uh, the, the entrepreneurs this is coincides with uh, what nick was to talking here that i am absolutely on his side that we need to look at what is happening in the reality that uh, entrepreneurs they have so so big uh, obligations that if not reducing those obligations it will be impossible for them to to uh, free some resources to organize uh, new businesses etc etc so my position which i wrote uh, last year is very strong and strict that we need uh, cutting taxes, we need cutting regulations and making uh, entrepreneurs uh, sure that there will be no changes in this policy. And then they will decide to risk more, they will decide to go to business and they will know what are the costs, real costs, because if without understanding it, without seeing what are the costs, it, it would be very uneasy for them to restart their business. And then there were some attempts, of course, in Georgia and other countries uh, by uh, of the governments to help the businesses. And I was critical about this very much. I was saying that how can government help? They will uh, simply create privileges to some groups or some businesses instead of really helping everybody. And I was saying that even for political reasons, it's wrong idea because you can create some friends during the pandemic, uh, during the crisis, but you can irritate and make uh, lots of uh, uh, people unfriendly to you if you help only some people and don't help others. Economically, politically, or any, any way, this, this is a mistake. That's what I was arguing a year ago. So here I'm, I'm going to stop and uh, uh, we don't have any, any time to answer questions, unfortunately. This format is not giving us a chance, but I'm, I want to conclude also that we are happy again to take part in this free market roadshow. This uh, format we created together, all together, maybe thousands of people in, with the leadership of Austrian Economic Center in, in Vienna. So we are hoping that next year it will be again a chance to cooperate uh, and uh, we'll have uh, our voice in our European Commonwealth to create more uh, um, opportunities for business and uh, to create more chances for uh, improving the situation after, after this pandemic, which was mostly artificial invention, as I believe. So here I'm stopping and Georgi, you want to say something? What do you say? So say something. Ah. Well, thank you. It was really great event. Unfortunately, we are limited in time, so there is not enough uh, <clears throat> minutes to answer on the question. So I want to thank all our speakers, um, and I want to thank the University Sukhan Sabah University for hosting this event. Not first time; it's already the third time we are uh, organizing a free market roadshow in the university, and we hope the next year. Uh, this university will host a real event in his 
beautiful building in his beautiful library we are now um, and i hope uh, we will chance to to avoid this pandemic um, situation and to have the chance to to have more interact um, events in the future thank you organizers Austrian economic um, center and uh, my colleagues from the economic school of georgia as well they did a great job to uh, to make this uh, event to happen so thank you all uh, for attending the event i I hope it was very interesting, so in the future we will have time to uh, discuss more interesting questions and we will have more time for this. Thank you all. I wish you...